Hello and welcome to this spotlight on paramedicine. My name's Tara and I've got a special recording for you today. Um, we're doing a little bit of a roundup on the um, ACP conference last week. I'm going to do a little bit of a chat and a review of the fantastic uh, closing address that Jordan Emery did last Friday. Um, I don't know if you were lucky enough to be in the room to experience that speech, but I certainly was. And I tell you, there was a magnificent buzz in the room. Um, it was like um, everything that he spoke about was um all the things that I think that so many of us have been wanting to hear for so long. And it was just amazing to hear him stand up um, and say so much of so many things that so many wanted, so many of us have wanted to say for so long. Um, and Jordan's a wonderful friend of mine and he has um, gladly uh, agreed for me to uh, do this chat tonight uh, and talk to you about um the conversation that he had about culture. So I've called it Jordan's culture of love. And uh, I'm just going to go through, not spend too much time on the culture hangups that he spoke about. Um, and just to spend a little bit more time on the loving leadership antidotes, because I feel like that's the focus of what we really need to be looking at. Um, it was fantastic that he really identified the things that um, really needed to be looked at and some things that have been going on for so long and really need to be addressed and stamped out if we want to move forward. Um, but looking at leadership and, and moving forward is really what we wanted to be doing now. So um, I won't waste any more time. We're going to get started. Um, I will share my screen and we will begin of course, teacher style, as we do. Um, I'd just like to begin today uh, with an acknowledge, acknowledgement of country, uh, the land in which I sit, the beautiful Gadigal people of the Euro Nation are the traditional owners of the land uh, upon which this podcast is recorded. Uh, I'd really like to pay respects to the elders past and present as the culture holders and sharers. I honour their strong culture and knowledges as vital of, to their self-determination, well-being and resilience of their communities. And I stand for a future that profoundly respects and acknowledges Aboriginal perspectives, culture, language and history. So Jordan's culture of love. Um, fantastic pictures there. Um, he's definitely got some power posing happening um, I like to say maybe did a bit of Amy Cuddy before he stood up on stage. Um, but it was such a wonderful start really just to um, talk a little bit about leadership and ident identify really where it is that, you know, we need to move forward uh, and the things that are holding us back. You know, he's looking pretty dapper on the stage, I must say, aren't you, Jordan? <laughs> so when we're talking about culture hang-ups, um, I mean, we're all pretty aware of what's going on here. Um, I'm going to say my interpretation of things because, you know, I mean, he spoke about what, what his side is, but where from where I sit, I mean, shit canning is basically just, you know, um, negativity all around, um, sitting in the car being negative, um, constantly uh, taking a negative stance on everything that happens. Um it happens all the time. I find being uh, an academic, I find my students come back a lot after being on placement uh, and comment the fact that their preceptors or the people that they were working with uh, when they were on placement were constantly negative and uh, under this shit canning heading. Um, common enemy intimacy. Uh, this actually came up in one of my conversations with Vic. So if you scroll through, um, she talks about that common enemy intimacy. So it's almost like uh, it's a form of when, uh, being able to bond with someone. So um, I know Jordan was talking about it um, being like um, someone gets left out. So it's almost like um, there is 
there is an enemy, but it's a way of people actually connecting at the same time. So um, it's a way of bonding in the way that you bond together because you both hate someone else. So, I mean, it's horrible, really, but um, there is like the way that it actually connects you together because you both hate the service or you both, you know, hate management or whatever it is that's going on. Power over and not power with, you know, this is obviously something that's been happening in the ranks for a really long time uh, and something that needs to be stamped out. I feel that there is some movement here just from my perspective, um, which is fantastic. Um, I do feel like there is a little bit of moving forward. Um, ambulance family, I think this was really controversial when you said this. I thought this was really interesting because I think that a lot of people bank on the ambulance family. The ambulance family and the police family and the fire brigade family is something that people talk about all the time. Um, and I'm in massive agreement in with what Jordan's saying on this one because I think that the ambulance family um is it's a workplace you know it's not your family you know it's not the people that are going to be there for you you know when you know you go home from work or you know when you, you lose your last dollar or when your partner breaks up with you or whatever uh, and it was really interesting because quite a number of years ago um I broke my leg when I was you know almost nine months pregnant and I was on work cover um, and I was off, you know, almost or going on to maternity leave. And at that time, not only was I not co uh, contacted by anyone from work cover, but I was not contacted by anyone from work either. So it was really interesting. And that was the first time that I ever had that perspective about the ambulance family not really being a family, you know, and that was, I think I was in the job you know, maybe 15, 16 years or something like that. Um, and that was my perspective then kind of going, hang on, you know, this is, you know, this is not a family, it's a workplace. Uh, and what Jordan was saying, actually, you know, from other perspectives saying, you know, when people think it's a family, then something negative happens or there's inappropriate um, behaviour, they're less likely to stand up and they're less likely to speak. All of this stuff is really true. So it's definitely worth um it's it's uh, it, you know his position on that is absolutely right you know it's not a family it's a workplace you know it's great when people get along it's really good when you know you have positive relationships at work but at the end of the day it's not your family so definitely agree on that one I wanted to throw this one in here because um when we're talking about loving leadership antidotes and we're talking about positive influence, I just wanted to kind of bring in, this is my why. Like this is why um, I, I do what I do. So this is my why. This is my beautiful students. This is my, my second year cohort at the moment, my gorgeous, wonderful students that I love so much. Um, and this is my why, why I get up every day and why I do what I do because I love my job. And it's, something um, that drives me and drives me in a positive way. And when you have a why, it really makes everything else, you know, move in a positive way because positive is so much better than negative. You want to move in a positive way. So when you find your why, um, it helps uh, and it really creates that momentum going forward. Um, I discovered this amazing guy called Simon Sinek um, a while ago, and he talks a lot about that. Um, and he talks a lot about love and creating that positivity as well. But he is he's one that kind of created that, uh, and he wrote a book about it a while ago, about the why, you know. Um, and when you talk to people about what you do, He's like, you know, you talk about the feeling and you talk about how you feel about what you do and then you talk about what you do and that, you know, is, is where, you know, it creates the feeling and the positivity at work. But anyway, I'm getting carried away. <laughs> Let's move on. So loving leadership antidotes. So the first one being psychological safety. 
So psychological safety, um, and he was referring to Amy Edmondson when uh, he was talking about psychological safety, and I nearly jumped up and down in the back of the room when he started talking about Amy because she's amazing um, and all of her stuff is brilliant. Um, if you get a chance um, and you're a TED person, watch her TEDx talk. Um, she's got some great articles out there as well, but I've given you a basic definition there about psychological safety. So it's basically just feeling safe enough that you can speak up, take risks, make mistakes without any fear of any negative consequences. So, you know, at any time you feel like um, if you see something happen, you know, if someone is drawing up a drug and about to administer it and you're looking at that and you think, oh, I'm not sure, I don't think that's the right dose. But, you know, if you're in a psychologically safe environment, you feel safe enough to speak up even if you're the junior officer. So it's all this kind of thing. So feeling safe in your environment to take risks and speak up without any fear of any kind of negative consequences. So that's basically what that is. So when we're talking about psychological safety, I wanted to kind of bring up um, how do we create that when we're in the ambulance environment? So I wanted to kind of bring in a little bit more information there that could be useful for you guys to use um, when you're in the workplace. So um, something there that I found really important. So she described three things that are really useful when it comes to psychological safety. So the first one being is if we frame the work as if it's a learning problem and not a personal problem. So when you have a trainee or if you have a, um, a student um, and you need to go through something, give them feedback or talk about their performance or anything like that, make sure that you refer to it like it's a learning problem and it hasn't got anything to do with the person. It's not personal or anything like that. So that kind of thing can be really important to help set the scene with that. So number two, acknowledge your own fallibility. None of us are perfect. So set the scene there. Make sure that you, you know, have conversations about mistakes that you've made so that you can reveal to them that, you know, at times that the same things happen to you you know, and those kind of things can make people feel really relaxed, you know, and that kind of um, environment is much more comfortable and much more conducive to learning. Uh, and the third one is to model curiosity. So always be curious, ask lots of questions, you know, um, always be interested in trying to find out what's going on. So even, you know, if you're the student, if you're the, you know, if you're the new graduate, if you're the preceptor, always try and find out what's going on and see, you know, if you can learn something, you know, every experience is a possibility for learning. Don't be afraid, you know, whenever we're in a situation where there's uncertainty and there's interdependency, be brave, you know, and speak out because in a psychological safe environment, you know, you can speak out and it's okay to be vulnerable. So just remember that and that's important there, Amy Edmondson. So number two was radical candor uh, and this was a great one as well. Kim Scott was the lady that he referred to who was the fantastic leader who wrote the book um, about radical candor. Um, and she was one who talked about giving direct and honest feedback. So this is one where you go, that's, um, uh, you know, not appropriate to do or, um, you know, provide someone feedback. So this one is really important to make sure that you set the scene right first. So make sure that um, you have gotten to know the other person and you're comfortable there. So I think it's almost like if we're providing a psychologically safe environment and we're setting everything up first, then radical candor can come second. 
So all of these things need to work together. You know, it's all working together. So if we can give direct and honest feedback to someone, then, you know, it's going to be a much safer and a much, you know, better working environment. So there's five steps that I can give you that will help um, you with um, being able to set up a situation where you can, you know, be a radically candid person. Um, now, number one is share your stories first. Now, it's really interesting. I wanted to point out with this one here. So, um, you know, being a, a lecturer at uni, I'm always surrounded by students who are going on placement and they're always nervous um, and not sure about what's going to happen when they go out. And, you know, if if you're in a situation where you're, you know, where you're feeling nervous uh, and you're meeting someone that you're going to be working with for four weeks or three weeks um, and you sit down with them and, you know, you start having conversation, maybe a coffee, um, talking over a few things, um, maybe share a couple of stories, you know. It can go either way. If you are the student on placement and you can detect that your preceptor um, is looking a little bit nervous, you know, maybe you can open up and say, you know, oh, this is my first placement. You know, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do around here. Um, I'm, you know, this is, I'm feeling a bit nervous and, you know, do you think you might be able to help me? Um, maybe kind of, you know, breaking the walls down that way might help a little bit. You know, it goes both ways. Maybe providing a little bit of, um, you know, conversation to ease the tension, you know, can help that way. Sharing stories. So after that one is solicit feedback. So prove that you can take it. So ask for feedback first. You know, is there anything that you think that um, I might be able to improve on? You know, ask. You know, or I was, um, you know, I've been trying to improve on my, you know, patient assessment. Um, is there anything that you think that I might be able to improve on in that area? You know, maybe be specific, you know, if there's something that, you know, that you're working on in particular. Um, growth management, you know, have a think about that. You know, when you're out there and you're in that learning process, um, it's a really good idea to schedule your time and think about how you want to progress over the next few months you know, what, how you want to be, where you want to get to over the next six, 12 months, you know, what you want to, your progress, your career progression to be like over the next three to five years, that kind of thing. Just, you know, start to plan ahead and see what you want to be doing over that time. Next tip, perfect your one-on-one -on -one conversations. That's a really good one. Um, have a think about, you know, how good you are at, you know, having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, have a think about how you can improve that kind of stuff. You know, maybe buy Kim Scott's book and see what other tips she's got there. Um, and also give guidance, you know, as um, a senior clinician or someone who um, is offering some guidance to someone else, offer praise and criticism, but make sure that you focus on the on the good stuff. You know, don't just um, you know pro, you know provide them with you know a whole heap of criticism and make them feel like crap, um, and then at the end of it, just walk away. Um, and the other thing that I wanted you to remember here with this one as well. So radical candor. Um, it's not your um, excuse to be um, a rude person so we put it that way so um you know those people that come up and they say oh I don't mean to be rude but uh and that's their excuse to be rude so we don't want any of that so radical candor is remembering that you are actually about to talk to someone who has feelings uh, and emotions uh and remember that and have a think about if you were about to receive the message that you were going to say to that person, how would you feel? So just remember that. Remember how it feels to receive, you know, criticism or, 
you know, have a think about what else that person's got going on at the time. You know, maybe they've got some things going on at home. Maybe their child's sick and they've been up all night. Um, maybe they've been having a fight with their partner. All sorts of things could be going on. So just remember that, you know, people have lives and they also have emotions. So when you're providing feedback or you're having a conversation with someone about things like that, that, you know, it is a person. So next step is vulnerability. So actually before vulnerability, we're talking about caring personally and challenging directly. So this is still related to our radical candor. Um, I popped a little picture up there of um, a wonderful um a wonderful mentor and manager of mine who uh, just about gets all of this right. So the balance between um, being the manager and remembering that uh, there is uh, a person on the end of the criticism. So we will um, identify her um, as Ms Kerry. Simpson and move on to the next one. So I had to put my um, my favourite and my um, mentor there, Kerry. So vulnerability. So moving on to vulnerability now, um, I didn't feel like I had to put anything in there because I feel like everybody knows who Brené Brown is um, except my office buddy, Adam. Um, Adam and I in the office um, on our whiteboard, I mean, everybody else puts um, uh, things about subjects, but we put quotes up. We put motivational quotes up in our office every week. And one week I decided to, it was a Brené Brown week. So every day I was going to put a different Brené Brown quote up. And then I wrote the first Brené Brown quote on the Monday and he said, who is Brené Brown? And I didn't quite know how to handle that. So Brené Brown, for everybody else except Adam, um, vulnerability. Um, this was me when I first started 24 years ago. Uh, changed a little bit, changed much, a few kilos heavier. Now, I just picked out my favourite Brené Brown quote. I mean, we can... I, <laughs> Where do you stop, really? I mean, there's so many of them. But vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy, and creativity. It is the source of hope, empathy, accountability, and authenticity. But specifically, vulnerability in leadership, it's not weakness. Now, this is where everybody gets confused. I think that... Um, people in management or quite often people in management think that if they open up or they reveal things about themselves that it's weakness, but it's actually the opposite of weakness. So when management open up about, you know, things that are going on or um, their, you know, challenging workload or whatever, it's a, mess, a measure of courage and it actually builds trust in the relationship between the manager and the staff member. So vulnerability builds and elevates performance amongst the team by the leader, you know, showing that, you know, there are limits to your workload uh, and then sometimes you do need help. And it's okay to admit that you need help um, if you are sometimes struggling. And it is a safe environment to admit that you're struggling. The only thing is that vulnerability requires a very high amount of emotional intelligence, and that is critical in leadership. So always, you know, open up uh, and ask for feedback, and that will help to um, improve um, performance. So finishing off with the last one. So 
we talked about high standards. Now, I wanted to have a little conversation about high standards, and it's really interesting um, because when we talk about high standards, I talk about I think of myself and I think of my own performance and I think of my opinion of myself. And it's interesting because um, I'm just reflecting back to a little speech that I watched yesterday from a wonderful leader that Jordan pointed out in his speech last Friday, Simone Haig, um, and she posted a speech that she did um, a, a little while ago and she talked about um, the fact that, you know, if you don't um, go into leadership, you can actually seek out roles and become leaders in other areas. And it really made me think about the things that I've done in my career and my roles um, both as an intensive care paramedic and as an academic and the fact that, you know, the roles that I've had haven't necessarily been directly leadership roles but I have been leaders as such. I have been a leader as such and I think that, it's kind of made me think that in a way I think we're all leaders. We lead ourselves and, you know, we lead others at times. You know, when we're attending to patients on scene, we are leaders because we're leaders of ourselves and we represent the service. Um, when we are working with a partner, you know, if we are training someone, we're leaders in that situation. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to lead a large number of people to be a leader. So I think that taking a moment to think about how you represent yourself as a leader of yourself is so important. And have a think about what kind of leader you want to be and what kind of leader you want others to see you as? What do you want people to think and what do you want them to say when you walk out of the room? Do you want them to say good things about you and positive things about your performance? Do you want them to say, you know, oh, she always looks impeccably dressed. You know, her uniform is spotless. You know, you know, her pants, you know, and her shirt, you know, she's always neat and tidy. She always comes into work on time and then her car at changeover is always stopped. Or do you want people to say, you know, oh, you know, she's always wearing those torn pants, you know, her shoes are scuffed and her uniform is always crushed. You know, she comes into work late. And she's always got a bad attitude. She's always complaining all the time. You know, she's whinging and she's, you know, bitching about the service, and complaining about stuff. The negativity rubs off on not just you but everybody around you. And it makes you feel awful on the inside as well. Take a moment and have a think about how you feel on the inside, you know, when you when you bitch and you complain about stuff. And have a think about, you know, the times when you're in the car, when you're in the ambulance and you're working with someone fun and happy and you're laughing and you're having a great day. Think about how that feels compared to when you're bitching and complaining and how that feels. Think about the standards that you want to have for yourself and the standards you want to have to represent yourself as a role model, as a paramedic. I know for me, I always want to represent myself with high standards.
my actions always uh i hope you got something from that today and um join me for my uh next uh spotlight on paramedicine and thanks jordan for an amazing speech uh you're wonderful and gorgeous and we all love you